okay, let's talk about what happens if you notice a change in your vision and you can't explain it by rubbing your eye or blinking a few times and it's a persistent symptom that, let's take an example, that you wake up or sometime later in the day you have difficulty seeing from one eye, let's call it the right eye. And it may or may not be painful. Sometimes it's just all by itself. Sometimes you have a little bit of pain when you move your eye. What do you do next? Well, you obviously want to find out why you have it, especially if, especially if it persists. There's no reason to panic, uh, but there is reason to think about trying to have it evaluated over the next 24 to 72 hours because it's scary, especially if you see that it's getting worse. But whatever you do, don't think the worst. And don't think you have something growing in your head or something that's going to make you blind. You just want to have it properly evaluated. So where do you go next? First and foremost is not to panic. And to be sure that it's nothing simple, even cleaning your glasses or just blinking a few times to see whether or not that clears your vision. Let's assume it doesn't clear your vision. And then you notice uh, that if you compare one eye to the other, that the vision in the bad eye is not as sharp or not as colorful as the vision in the good eye. So it's not an emergency, but it is something that you should have evaluated within the next several days. Most people, and I think it's probably a good idea, is to start with your primary care physician, since they know your health uh, and your background uh, better than a specialist does. If they feel uncomfortable with your symptom, they may send you on to uh, various types of providers. For instance, an optometrist uh, is very capable of examining your eye, uh, especially the front of your eye, and giving you glasses to see whether they can correct your vision. If it's correctable, then go no further. There's nothing more to be done except consider whether to wear a pair of glasses that corrects your vision. If the optometrist finds that the vision is not correctable, then you have a choice and they have a choice. Uh, their choice is to whether or not to send you to somebody who has a little bit more training in the optic nerve. Um, as a neuro-ophthalmologist, uh, I, I saw a lot of patients uh, who were sent to me by optometrists simply because they couldn't correct visual loss. Uh, you, on the other hand, also have a choice to go from an optometrist to an ophthalmologist. An ophthalmologist, in contrast to an optometrist, is a medical doctor and has gone through medical school. Uh, admittedly, most will say that they feel very comfortable with conditions that affect the front of the eye, but also feel a little uncomfortable with conditions affecting the optic nerve. Uh, but that varies from one to the next. So. At some point in this cascade of physicians, you may see a neurologist who is very good at examining the brain and the spinal cord, but when it comes to the visual system, uh, they may not have the same comfort zone as somebody who does both. So it's not an advertisement to see a neuro-ophthalmologist. It rather gives you a guide as a patient as to where to go from the first response where you first notice some blurry vision in one eye, it doesn't seem to get better. In fact, it may get worse over the next seven or 10 days and you want it taken care of because you're nervous that you're gonna go blind, which is a very uncommon event in any form of optic neuritis. Diagnosis, optic neuritis. You as the patient, what do you do next? Um, you're treating uh, provider, whether they be a neurologist, neuro-ophthalmologist, or ophthalmologist, what do they do next? You as the patient, uh, now that the internet is available, will probably go through all the various things that there are available on the internet about optic neuritis. And I think that's educational, but I also think that it can be scare unnecessarily scary and inaccurate. So if you have questions, you find somebody who you trust and you ask them the questions uh, that you have. So you feel as if you get good answers because everybody's different. The trouble with looking up a condition is that everybody has a variation on the theme. So if you have a cousin or a friend with optic neuritis, you're an entirely different case. 
Um, you will be told not to take a hot shower, not to take a hot bath, not to play sports that raise your body temperature. All of that is fallacious and untrue. You may notice if your body gets overheated that your vision may blur a bit, but each and every time, as soon as body temperature returns to normal, your vision returns to baseline. So there's no reason to be afraid of exercising, having children, having a normal life. Uh, and I think that's important that you don't consider yourself disabled or an invalid. Um, you and the person taking care of you have to decide whether your form of optic neuritis requires treatment because mild cases where vision is affected mildly does not warrant treatment. Optic neuritis has an excellent natural history of visual recovery without treatment. Um, and there are certain things that your doctor can look for that can tell them whether you have a favorable outcome of improving spontaneously, spontaneously meaning without treatment, or whether or not uh, they think that medication should be given. The medications that are given to reverse visual loss uh, are usually some form of steroid that you take for a short amount of time. The most common one that's given is uh, intravenous steroids for three to five days. Um, if that doesn't seem to reverse the visual loss, there is a second form of medication that's given as an intramuscular injection, as an injection. Um, and then there are some who will use oral prednisone. And if you take a large enough doses of oral prednisone, uh, the results are quite good and comparable in many situations to taking the intravenous or intramuscular form of treatment. Uh, but the large dose of oral prednisone has its risks in terms of irritating your belly uh, and producing gastric irritation, even gastric ulcers. So it's not a simple decision, and it has to be made in concert with your primary care physician who knows your other medical conditions and with a person who's seen a lot of patients with optic neuritis. Um, the group of specialists that I listed before, the neuro-ophthalmologist probably has the most um, experience with optic neuritis. Um, and I think that's a good person to see if you can possibly see them. Uh, how do you prepare yourself for your examination? Uh, accept the possibility that they will dilate your eyes and, and with that your eyes become very sensitive to light. Uh, so bring a pair of good sunglasses with you. Uh, you can drive, you'll have difficulty reading, and depending upon the drops that are used, that difficulty with light sensitivity and reading uh, may last several hours. Um, if you go to a neurologist, they will probably ask you to put on a gown and do a general neurologic examination. Nothing painful, uh, just a good physical examination. Um, and the eye doctor examination is, is, is pretty routine. And the most impressive in part of the eye, uh, eye examination is the fact that your pupils will be dilated, or they should be dilated. Um, so they get a good look at the back of your eye. In a person with who you think has optic neuritis, the evaluation can be minimal or it can be extensive. For instance, if you obtain a history that a person was uh, exposed to cats or kittens, then that brings in the possibility of cat scratch. If the person has had other medical conditions such as HIV or colitis or lupus uh, or cancer, then that brings in the decision to put patients through an array of testing to look for the cause of their optic neuropathy. Um, an MRI scan has become the standard in terms of the first test that's ordered. A CT should not be done. A CT involves radiation and it really provides much less value than an MRI scan. And uh, the possibility of CT causing radiation is real and the, the, the dye that's introduced intravenously with a CT has more likelihood of producing an allergic reaction than the material that's used uh, during an MRI. So an MRI is safer um, and it's more sensitive and more specific. 
inflammation is uh, what happens, for instance, if you get a mosquito bite. Uh, the bite itself may be very small, but the area of redness surrounding the bite is inflammatory. If you cut yourself during the first few minutes, the cut may be very narrow, but the redness that surrounds the cut is inflammatory. So inflammation is a response to injury. The question that's been raised is whether optic neuritis is hereditary, and there is a form of optic neuritis that occurs in, in, along hereditary lines, mostly in men. And so it's always important to ask patients, especially men patients with optic neuritis, whether they have a brother or a maternal uncle, their mother's brother whether they had visual loss of unknown cause. Because this particular form of hereditary optic neuritis is transmitted um, along those lines. And it's important to know whether or not that's a problem because hereditary optic neuritis um, excludes the possibility of doing a lot of other testing that you may not need. The most common symptoms people feel with optic neuritis is blurred vision. Blurred vision mostly in the center of your visual field, mostly right in the center of vision. And in the same area, you notice that bright colors don't appear as vivid. So people will come in and say, um, gee, I don't see red or blue or green quite as well as I do with the other eye. Some people with optic neuritis will have pain in the eye, especially when they move the eye. Uh, those are the most common symptoms of optic neuritis. The treatment of optic neuritis is done on an outpatient basis. There's no need to hospitalize somebody unless they have a particular reason why intravenous steroids can cause problems. But for the most part, it's an entirely an outpatient procedure. A home health service can come to your house and give you the intravenous steroids. It's usually a three to five day course. Uh, and there's no reason to taper after the three to five days of intravenous steroids. The chances of going blind from optic neuritis are extremely small. Uh, vision can be compromised, and it can be compromised permanently, but blindness is a very uncommon consequence of optic neuritis. Optic neuritis can definitely recur in the same eye or the other eye, um, and you just have to have a relationship with someone who is familiar with optic neuritis and go back and say, I think my vision is not as good as it was before. Uh, do I or do I not have another case of optic neuritis? Because people with optic neuritis can also require glasses. Okay, there's an old adage that a dog can have ticks and fleas. Uh, just because you have optic neuritis doesn't mean a recurrence of visual loss means you have another case of optic neuritis. You can have something that's more common like requiring glasses. You have to decide how comfortable you are with the people who are taking care of you. And you want doctors who take your symptoms seriously, who don't casually dismiss them, and don't say to you things like, go home, don't worry about this, there's no reason to go any further. On the other hand, you also want to go to somebody who's not overly aggressive because Sometimes patients with optic neuritis require more testing than just an MRI and blood work. Um, on occasion, they may need to have their spinal fluid examined. None of those tests are terribly uncomfortable, um, and on rare occasions, they need to be done. So you need to feel comfortable with the person you're seeing in terms of how aggressive or how conservative they should be in your case. Obviously, if your vision gets better, there's more reason to be conservative. If your vision doesn't get better or it gets worse, then there's more reason to do things and intervene with other testing. You have to feel very comfortable with your doctor. I think that's really an important thing and express your fear uh, and your anxieties. Just like I would if I had some problem and I was scared about it, I sure would express my fear and anxiety. So I hope that we have reviewed this topic of optic neuritis, what it is, what to do about it, uh, how to prepare yourself for the examination, not to panic. Um, life goes on and you'll be able to carry on a perfectly normal lifestyle, hopefully. 
uh, and you don't want to modify your life so much because you want to be in control of the disease as much as you possibly can, not let it control you. Thank you.